guess we'll go right into our Bible study, but anyway, um, appreciate everyone. Uh, I thought I might say something here today about uh, the Bride of Christ. Um, you know, we um, we have a we we say a lot about the bride, but I don't know how many people really have very many scriptures in their mind or that can go to them and and show somebody, you know, uh, that there really is a difference between the bride of Christ and and the rest of God's children that will inherit everlasting life. I can tell you, some of you grew up here in the body, so you don't, you may never have been out in Babylon. But <clears throat> I was in Babylon, and I was a minister in Babylon for several years, assistant pastor for many years, and... Uh, traveled in the ministry before I found the body and never one time was I taught neither did I really realize that the bride was a different set of people than the entire group of people that would inherit everlasting life never were we taught that there's a separation out there I don't know of any group that does teaches it now so when you deal with people out in Babylon they don't most of them, I mean, it's been a while. Of course, I've been in the body for over 40 years now, but but I've kept up with quite a bit out there. I still don't know of a group that recognizes the bride of Christ as the ruling and reigning elop for a thousand years. We never, you know, one of the things that people failed to do is to ask questions, to even think of questions. Uh, like for an example, who would the bride rule and reign over <laughs> if all of God's people made the bride <clears throat> uh, for a thousand years? And so uh, I think, you know, I just jotted down s several scriptures, and I think, you know, there's many more. I just didn't have time to go into it very in very much depth, but um, I think there's there's a lot of scriptures that we could look at that for certain. Uh, <clears throat> number one, um, let's look at the sixty first chapter of of Isaiah. And, uh, by the way, this chapter, in the fourth chapter of, uh, of Luke, uh, if you want to just look there first, Luke 4.21 says, Jesus, uh, <clears throat> let me back up maybe a little bit. Uh, when Jesus was... Um, Here it is, when he came to Nazareth, in the 16th verse, Luke 4 and 16, it says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him a book, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So I read that because 
Isaiah, he's quoting from Isaiah 61. In fact, the book of Isaiah was handed to him. Of course, they weren't labeled with scriptures back then on the scrolls. But look in Isaiah 61. Uh, says exactly what he read. The Spirit of the Lord God's upon me. First verse. Because he anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, and he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the place of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Uh, <clears throat> so here, Isaiah 61, he's talking about uh, the uh, uh, Jesus is talking about our Isaiah was prophesying of Jesus coming and him being the one that the Spirit of God was upon to do this work that he's prophesying of. If you'll drop down to the 10th verse, it says, I, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of righteous, of salvation. Um and has covered me with the robe of righteousness. I might just throw this in right here, if you want to make a little note. Revelations 19, 8, is, talks about the linen, the robe of, the linen white robe of righteousness, which is the righteousness of the saints. And just, you know, it's just a good note to have with that, <clears throat> the fact that he was clothed with, uh, the robe of righteousness. Then it says, As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorn herself with her jewels. And you might want to make a note right there that jewels are mentioned in Malachi 3. Where is that? Is that in the 17th verse where he said that in the day that I make up my jewels. I'll remember. The book of remembrance are made, <clears throat> and I will remember them, those that feared the Lord and spake often to one another in the day that I make up my jewels. So I had somebody ask me one time, you know, how do we know if jewels is talking about the bride? Well, I'll refer them to this, this chapter right here because this chapter is definitely talking about a bride adorning herself with her jewels uh, then skip down into the 62nd chapter. It says, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. First, let me say, Zion is the mountains of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, is, was the capital of Israel, and, and that's where the temple was. And that's why Jerusalem's mentioned so many times. It's called the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem in, in Hebrews 12. Uh, and he said, And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Uh, remember in Revelations 2 that was a promise to overcomers that they would receive a new name that no one could uh, receive except they or no one yeah would receive except the ones that he gave it to so <clears throat> no one could know that name except they that received it that's what it says well it's just what that really means is, is you can't really know righteousness of God until you are righteous. Once you receive it, the new name, or, you know, name stands for character. 
and uh, you you can't have the character of complete righteousness under perfection until you've reached it. And that's the only person that's going to really know that. I think a a a a person that reaches perfection will know it. Uh, the apostle Paul, he made the statement in his letter to Timothy said, I fought a good fight, and I finished the course. He, he knew he had finished. <clears throat> Peter stated, he said, he, he was talking in his letter and saying, I'm not, uh, it doesn't bother me, is what he was really meaning, to put you in remembrance of these things, and I'm telling you, uh, as long as he's here, he's going to do it, he said. But he said, I... Uh, but he said, I must shortly put off this tabernacle as the Lord hath shown me. He knew he was fixing to die. He knew God was fixing to, and, and he knew he was going to take off that, that old body and put on a new one. If this, uh, if this house be dissolved, Paul said, then we have a new house from the Lord in heaven. Anyway, let's read down just a little bit. Uh, verse 3 says, Thou shalt be crowned, thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Now, a diadem is a turban. That's what it is. And that word royal, if you look it up, um, let me see if I can give you the, here's the, the word royal there, here's the uh, Hebrew Strong's definition. It says something ruled around a, a kingdom, kings, royal, um, a kingly office. So this, uh, let me see, yeah. So, and so that's, you know, this this is a and, and, and verse three uh, in the beginning there he he said that'll also be a crown of glory. In other words, isn't that what Paul said? I finished my fight. I, I kept the faith. Therefore, there is uh, laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He knew he was going to be in the ruling element. Um, <clears throat> then in verse four it says, "Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken." Neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah. Uh, Hephzibah means my delight is in her. That's what it means. Thou shalt be called his delight. And thy land, Beulah. And the word Beulah means um, to marry. Uh, it means to for to marry, it's uh, or be a husband or a dominion, a wife, a married wife. Thou shalt be called Beulah, a married wife, or the bride. For thou, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. That's basically what Beulah means. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. I'm just giving you some scriptures here that um, uh, you know are, are relating to the bride, just to show that there are scriptures that that shows us there's going to be a bride of Christ. Um, Let's see if, what else I can give you. Um, we might, uh huh. To be in the bride, we've got to be perfect, don't we? Uh huh. Okay, we talk about perfection, but would you define what is expected of us to be perfect? See, we talk about things like that. Maybe we don't know what all it's going to be, but we need to know. So, I mean, at least I do. <laughs> okay. Well, um, 
<clears throat> I think if you'd go turn to um, Hebrews, the sixth chapter, probably is a, uh, and we'll start in the in the fifth chapter uh, of Hebrews. Okay, Hebrews 5 and 12, we'll start there. It says, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need, need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and, and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Now, <clears throat> he starts off here saying, if you're a babe in Christ, I had a pastor in the Dominican Republic that he, you know, he, he got this message from me, but he, 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 he started preaching if we've got Jesus, we've got everything. Therefore, we don't need nothing else than what we got to make perfection. And I said, well, when you received the Holy Ghost, did you, do you have Jesus? I said, yeah. I said, well, do you need anything else besides the Holy Ghost when you got it? Was you ready to be, be in the bride? Was you perfect at that time? Was you without sin? Did you have everything you needed, or was you just a babe in Christ? I said, see, this is a progressive work, and it takes growth and maturity. You can start out as a baby, but he that's of full age, and the Bible says, he that's of full age, strong meat belongs to him, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So, there's a lot of things that you and I don't even and didn't even know what was evil until God showed us. It might have been through study and reading the Word of God. It may have been a, a preacher that, that preached and mentioned it and gave us a, a understanding, a greater understanding of what was evil that we maybe we didn't know it was evil. A lot of people come to the body unless they're taught righteousness. You know, there's a lot of things they're doing that's, that's wrong. And they have to grow to a place to realize, hey, that's not righteous. It's, it's not a, I'm not carrying the proper balance of righteousness in my life. And so there's, there's adjustments that they have to make. So he shows that there's a difference between a baby and a one that's full age and then he says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. All right, now here is one of the things, Sister Crow, is that you need to reach perfection. You'll have to leave the principles. First, you're going to have to get those principles. And what that means, it don't mean leave them off. It means go on beyond just receiving the principles let us go on unto perfection. And uh, not laying again the foundation of repentance and from dead works. I'm sure there he's writing to the Hebrews, so I'm sure he's referring to the law. Those were dead works. They would not produce righteousness. They wouldn't produce holiness, true holiness in your life. Uh, they were rituals. They were a picture and symbolic of, of what Christ came to fulfill. But, uh, but even, you know, laying again the uh, foundation of repentance, 
uh, you know, that's a lot of people do. I mean, in Babylon, that's what they're taught. It's just, you can't keep from sinning, so just keep repenting. Sin and repent, sin and repent. You, you may not ever grow, but, you know, in fact, it just depends. You can choose out there. I've got, there's uh, someone in my family that never could really grow in the Lord, so they decided to become a Catholic because you don't have to grow out there. All you got to do is just say your Hail Marys and our fathers and and maybe pay a little penance and you're good to go. You know, but it, you, there's no restrictions on the flesh, the work of the flesh, the, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. So... Uh, you can pick and choose. A lot of people do that. I was mentioning it here just a week or two ago. I said a lot of people, they decide that they know more than the Bible. And so they just decide, well, here's what I believe about, you know, here's what I believe about going to heaven. Here's what I believe. But what you believe don't mean, a, it don't mean zero to God unless you're believing the truth and you've got enough of it. You can lie to yourself and deceive yourself if you want to, but the truth of the matter is, it's going to take righteousness to inherit everlasting life. And we need God's help. Like I mentioned in the Bible study Thursday, Thursday night, the very first category of prayer is contrition. A contrite spirit. God's nigh them that are a, of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. That word contrite means to be crushed as powder. It means somebody that when, when they recognize their need for God, they, they humble themselves enough to realize, God, I need you. I need the truth. I need your help. I need your, your strength of the Spirit of God and the Word of God in my life. And I'm willing to submit my life to you and be humble enough to realize I'm a child of of your creation and I, I need help and I'm not willing to make up my mind you know I said also here recently I said this what I'm what I'm preaching to y'all is not a polyparated message I, I'm not preaching just what I heard what I've always heard I've studied it out for myself I absolutely know that what I'm teaching is what I have studied out through the Bible, and, and it's not just but what I heard. When I first came here, I polyparented. I taught what I'd always heard, taught. But you have to grow to a place that you finally say, why do I believe this? The, will a Bible substantiate it? Will it hold it up? And that's why we need ministers that are willing to continue to search the Word of God until we locate the truth of the Word of God in a, in a restored church where the ministry absolutely knows the truth. It's not good enough to have all these divisions in doctrine. That's what Babylon's got out here. The difference in us and Babylon, well, there's a lot of difference in us because God called this body for the, not only the church of, uh, uh, the purpose of restoring the church, but to perfect saints. Isn't that what Isaiah, the 12th chapter says? You have come to the Mount Zion, where the spirits of just men are made perfect. It's going to take the Mount Zion. That, that represents the church, New Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem. In fact, he says that, the heavenly Jerusalem. He, he calls it the Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. And so it does take, it does take, it's going to take men of God that will keep working on it. We can't be satisfied on this side of Jordan. And so we, we have to keep working on it. I, I think we already have a lot of truths, but I don't think we got them all. And therefore, I don't think that we can stop and be satisfied with where we're at. And a lot of people are there. A lot of people, that when God gets through shaking this body, yes, we will. Yes, we will, because when God restores the church, He'll choose out apostles. 
and give them power that the early church apostles had, and they'll have such power that you'll fear God like you've never feared God before. And that word fear don't mean just be afraid of, but it means to re reverence the, the work of God and the, the power of God, the operation of God, the order of God, and they will have power and demonstration of the Spirit. They'll heal the sick. They'll raise the dead. They'll do everything early apostles done. When we have men like that, you'll pay more attention to them. You know, right now men, you know, can dispute me and they, they, you know, they can argue and they can say whatever they want to say. You know, I'm lacking enough power to shut the mouths of gainsayers. I may have enough of the Word of God to deal with it, but to some extent. But I think all of us in the ministry have to be humble enough and, and truthful enough to recognize we're lacking the power and demonstration of the Spirit. And we need to keep... And, and that will come... Remember what Jesus said? Hand me those, that, that scroll of Isaiah. And he said, This day you see this is fulfilled when he read... The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me for this reason. You know, I was thinking today about, I've got men in the Dominican Republic that work against me from other places. You know, you're, you're going to have that. As long as you're in the ministry, you're going to have somebody working iniquity against you in your own church, in other churches, in your administration, whatever. But I was just going over some of that in my mind, some of the iniquity that's been worked against me. But I concluded my thoughts, and I thought, yes, there's other men fought me, but the difference between me and them in the Dominican Republic is God sent me to the Dominican Republic. That's the difference. God sent this man over there. I didn't have nothing to do with it. God did it. And, and if God does that, he will establish you know, it takes God do, doing those things. I know it sounds boastful, but it's, it, Paul sounded pretty boastful, and I'm not, no comparison to Paul, for sure. Uh, now, going back, Sister Crow, let's go back to here leaving the principles, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith towards God. In other words, to go into perfection, you've got to get to a place where you don't keep having to reestablish your faith that you, you, you know, that, that you're sold or you're satisfied, you're established in the body of Christ. And you don't have to keep laying that foundation. I was going to say a minute ago, before this is over with, there'll be plenty of people shook out. There'll be a lot of people shook out of this before it's over with. In fact, what, a lot of what we're going through, there's people being shook out now. We got people gone that was here. They didn't have enough enough uh, vision to stay here. And, and that just happens, you know. It, uh, people go through things, and our hope is, is if they leave, that God will help them come back before it's over with. I do believe God will deal. He'll deal with every... He'll, he'll deal with every stone. He'll, he'll overturn every stone that he can to save whoever can be saved of his children. He loves his children. Then it says that we're going to not laying again the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. You ought to have a pretty good foundation of those doctrines in your understanding. You ought to know that there's two baptisms. You ought to know how to explain something about them, what they're important. In other words, the uh, water baptism. What does water baptism do? You know, I was just thinking uh, here recently about God's, the power of God's dealing with the person unto repentance, uh, sealing it with water baptism, and how that is so rich to some people. I, I got to thinking about that, and I got to speaking in tongues, Sister Crow, just about repenting, God dealing with me enough to cause me to humble myself to repent of my sins. 
not just getting the Holy Ghost, <clears throat> but, but, and of course, we have to lay again that foundation of repentance a lot of times as we grow in God. You know, you, we do fall, we do fail, and we have to repent. We have to keep going. But sooner or later, we got to quit laying again those foundations and stop some of this sinning that we're repenting of. And not just some of it. Eventually, you got to stop it all. But, but remember this last statement in this verse. It says, and this will we do if God permit. So it's going to take... Uh, God giving us per permission to go the next level of where we need to be. And then from there, it'll take God's permission to go to the next level. Because you can't, you can't skip. You can't go from the fifth grade to the, to, to the twelfth grade in one jump. You just can't do it. There's too much for you to go through. There's too much for a process that you're going to have to gain enough knowledge about. Holy Ghost baptism, you know, what... What that is, what it actually, you know, do you know most people out in the religious world of Christianity do not understand that's a birth? They do not understand that's receiving the nature of God through a new birth. They think they get that when they repent. And so, <clears throat> you know, you need to have enough understanding. You need to be able to teach your children. Uh, men need to be priests of their own household. They need to be able to help their wives and explain to their wives the Word of God. And, uh, you know, there's several things that would be good for you to learn how to, to explain to your wife. Not, you know, spiritual. If you can explain natural things, I was teaching my wife just this morning, or maybe it was last night, uh, how an air conditioner unit operates in a home what the condenser does, what the A-coil does, how, why it can freeze up, what causes it to freeze up, why, what, how, what makes this thing operate. It, it'll help you, you know. If you can look at an air conditioner where the copper pipe comes out of the blower and it's froze up, there's ice on it, the unit's froze up, the A-coil's froze up. You need to turn it off and let it thaw out. And you can turn it back on and see if it'll keep working. If it, if it does it again and again, then it's, the egg coil needs to be cleaned. It's filthy, and it can't get enough air through it. And therefore, the Freon freezes up inside there, and the whole thing's like a block of ice. So it has to, sometimes you have to clean it or replace it. <laughs> sometimes it just has it just things wore out. Brother Paul, he's replaced mine and my house, and... He's replaced them everywhere I know of that we got anything to do with. It's just part of it. Anyway, uh, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, that's talking about the ministry. For God's hand, the hand of God. It ain't just talking about somebody laying their hands on you and praying for you. It's talking about coming under the mighty hand of God. It's talking about uh, humbling ourselves under the hand of the Lord. And I understand there's two sides of this. You know, there is a side to the fact that the hand of God needs to be easy to be entreated. It needs to be pure. It, its intent, the, its purpose, its motive, all of that needs to be right in the ministry. And then God's working on the... That's why we don't have a restored church yet. We don't have a ministry that can hold up a restored church. God's working on the ministry and the saints at the same time. Resurrection of the dead. If I, you know, I'm not planning on doing all this. I ain't never resurrected. You know, if I can just, if I'm going to die anyway and it's all over, then I'm just going to do the best I can do. And forget y'all. You know, <laughs> I mean, I mean you know, what are we, what are we doing? It, it, didn't Paul say that in 1 Corinthians 15? We're of all men most miserable. If, if, there, if Christ didn't really exist, if He's not really our Savior, then we're preaching a big lie. And then we're just miserable men trying to do something that's impossible to do. 
but we're not miserable and we're not trying to do something impossible because it's the word of the of the only true God, the source of all life. Uh huh. Brother Smith. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Would you make a distinction between the resurrection of the dead and the doctrine of, uh, <clears throat> of baptisms? The resurrection of the dead and the doctrine of baptism? It, it seems, for, <clears throat> excuse me, the doctrine of baptisms, baptism is death, burial, and resurrection. So is there a distinction to be made between those two doctrines? Yes. Baptisms is a picture of resurrection. It's not truly a resurrection, uh, except the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You could use it as a resurrection unto life because there's a new birth there, and there is a death. There's a death. There, there is a, a death to the will. There's not a true death to the old man. He's not dead yet. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take crucifying him. You really get rid of him. But there is a step in death that you die out to your own will and you die out to that old man's, that nature. You're willing to give up that nature to receive this new nature. But the resurrection of the dead is the end work of the doctrine of, bab of baptisms. In other words, when, when uh, the first baptism is a baptism, or the first resurrection is a baptism of the Holy Ghost, in its finished work. In other words, you receive this new nature, but this new nature's not matured unto the full age. And when it does, and finally, I, I might as well say this right here. I don't only think you get to you have to, you don't only have to get to the place of living above sin. You have to live above sin before you reach perfection. You, you have to live in the garden. It's a sinless place. You can't sin in the garden. Uh, and, and you're going to have to live above sin for God to finish His work in you while you're in the holy place. You're going to have to live a life. Jesus lived above sin. He, he didn't give over to sin. He had the power to do that. And that's another reason I think we have to have a restored church. we got to have enough power of God to accomplish uh, what uh, God wants us to accomplish. And so I think we, we'll have to live in this state where we're living above sin, but for God to finish us. See, Adam, Adam was in the garden, and he had enough power to live above sin, didn't he? God told him, you sin. You, if you sin, you're going to die. So he had enough power... To live in the garden above sin. But he chose to sin. He didn't have to sin. He chose to sin. But he had the power in the garden to live above sin. But he wasn't perfect. He had to live in that condition until he, God finished it, that work of sinless living in him. Of how to operate in that state. No, 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 Jesus, when Jesus came to this earth, he was a baby. When Adam was created, he was created with all the knowledge Jesus, Adam was, Jesus wasn't. No, Adam was not, he didn't finish the work. In other words, Adam was... He was created, there wasn't anything wrong with him, and he had the, the knowledge and the power in the creation. Well, well, Jesus, when Jesus was mature, he reached perfection. He finished the work. Adam didn't. Adam never reached perfection. Well, I thought he I thought he was created perfect, is what I thought. He that just means he was created. There wasn't anything faulty or wrong in God's creating that man. 
that man was not, he was, there wasn't any, what's the word I'm wanting? Um, you know, when you have something wrong with you, you know. Defect. Defects. Yep. He had no defects. He was, he was pure. And he had a knowledge, but he did not, he had not reached a place where he qualified for eternal life in that he was perfect in in all of his maturity. He wasn't he hadn't reached that yet. But he had he was living in a place that he was he was able to live above sin or God would have never told him he couldn't sin. Yeah. You know, God wouldn't tell you you can't do something you can't do or you can or that you can do something you can't do. So uh, he had the ability to live, but he couldn't stay in that place once he did sin. That's why I say when we reach a place, the the early church, I'm getting off our subject, but anyway, it's still all right. But the, er, in the, <clears throat> the early church had the holy place, which in my opinion is a type of the Garden of Eden paradise all right so that was available on the day of Pentecost but there wasn't anybody there wasn't anybody that was mature enough to enter they had to develop in that place and if Stephen made it he got in that place in a pretty quick period of time just a few years but <clears throat> Uh, but it took some time to develop in that place. And people that came in, they still came in the outer court, and they had to go through a process of growing and developing to a place. Once they entered into that holy place, I'm talking about your individual walk and relationship with God that elevates you to a place that you've, you've entered the holy place then I don't think you can't sin. So you don't want to you don't want to go into that. I don't think you want to go into that place until you're you're capable. And this will we do if God permits. Am, am I am I am I making sense or clear to y'all about what I'm saying? Because you in other words <clears throat> Jesus lived he was capable just like adam was once he reached a certain place in god he was capable of living above sin and he never committed a sin he, he had that power i don't know if I'm, i met a man that had that power you know i'd like to i'd like to meet a man that i think's got that power i've met some men that i think were pretty righteous but I don't know that I ever met, I don't think, I don't, well, in fact, I'm just certain in my mind that I never met a perfect man that reached perfection. So, and I, and I would have to say, you know, I may be throwing something out that might be a little bit uh, different to you, but, um, uh, I, I, I'll just say this: I hadn't been too many years that I real that I realized that that you'd have to reach a place in the holy place before you could reach perfection, or that you'd have to get to a sinless place. Anyway, um, just wondered if he didn't if he didn't have uh, a lot of knowledge well he thought, did there's no question about it god gave him tremendous wisdom naturally and spiritually but he hadn't reached place spiritually if if we said he had then we would say a, a person that reaches per perfection can still fall and i don't believe that well, see i think not one, to do it though but it was well, but are we saying that after people inherit eternal life, they still could be disobedient and get kicked out? That's not biblical. So, 
So what we're saying is, is Adam was, he was created perfect without any uh, ill effects uh, in his natural creation. And his mind was, God gave him a, a perfect mind that, that could accomplish what God wanted him to accomplish. I don't, I don't see anywhere scripturally that God made Adam fall. And, and that was a decision of Adam, but he didn't have to make that decision. Uh, it wouldn't have been fair for God to put him in a condition where he's had the ability, or where he didn't have the ability to keep from sinning and have death pronounced on him because he was put in a place that he had to do, had to, to sin. He was put in a place he didn't have to sin. He did it willfully, the Bible says. He, he, he wasn't deceived in what he done. So, so we and so we do have to grow in these places. Uh, and I know this is a strong message. You know, I know that. And but let me let me help you with this. Let me say this much to help you with it. You cannot you cannot achieve this just because you want to. What you can do is you can serve God to the best of your ability and trust Him to complete the work in you. We're called His workmanship. And remember this, even the Old Testament saints, He didn't forget them, even though they couldn't make perfection, in the day that He made up His jewels. He's going to make them up again, and God won't forget you. If you'll serve God and do all you know to do, you know I, that thief on the cross, there wasn't a whole lot he could accomplish on that cross. But he evidently accomplished enough humility and enough contrition that through faith he was justified for a resurrection. And that's that that I. I try to live that way in my life that, you know, I told the Lord just the other day. I was sitting outside in my chair in the evening. I do that sometimes, especially if there's a little breeze or before the sun goes down. I'll go out and just sit down in my chair and just watch the birds take baths in my little bird bath. And you know, I was watching a cardinal and a blue jay and, uh, Oriole and a little fish, a little, is it fisk? Finch. Finch, huh? Finch. Finch, that's it, thank you. A little finch. I watched a little bitty finch. You know, he wasn't but about that big. And I just, then I got, I was looking at the tree, trees and the leaves, and I told God, I said, God, you're such an awesome creator. Your, your creation is so awesome. I told him, I said, I, I've never seen all the wonders of this world, but, but what I have seen is absolutely a wonder. And I said, if there's any way I can live forever with you, I hope you grant that to me. I'm praying you help me make it. Because I want to, if, if, how great this creation is, what in the world is it going to be like? That that place where there is no suffering and there's no sorrow and there is no pestilence. There's no more sin and death. My Lord. I can't even... Sometimes I get lost thinking about that. And, mm, I'm, I, the older I get, Sister Crow, the more I want to go. The older I get, the more I want to go. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm behind you. <laughs> oh God! If I, it's like that song says, you know, just look for me at Jesus' feet, because I'm planning on being there. Praise God. Well, we didn't get on these scriptures because I just gave a few scriptures, but I wanted to give you enough scriptures to show you that the bride was a ruling and reigning element. We'll we'll finish it. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to give you some, some scriptures, prophecies of the Old Testament that prophesies of the bride, but then show what the bride is, that there is a difference 
because you could just take the scriptures I gave you and just say, well, that's just talking about the church, if you wanted to say that. But when you look into other scriptures, you'll see it can't be just talking about the church. It's talking about a, this married wife who's prepared herself and made herself ready that's going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So I just wanted to give enough scriptures on that. Anyway, Brother Kyle, it's good to see you. Good to have Brother Kyle with us. Uh, he's been sick in the hospital. We've been praying for you. I'm glad to see that you're alive and well. So anyway, we're out of time, so we'll just take a break. We'll see you upstairs. Have church at 1130. God bless your hearts.